in my talk today, I'm going to cover some of the history of isotope geochemistry. I hope that will be of interest to, to people, particularly younger listeners who, who might not be aware of some of the key players in, in this. Uh, and I'm going to introduce some, some data that, that we've um, determined here at UEA, principally by my, my, my co co-workers, uh, Alina here, who, who is the, the isotope lab manager, Richmal, who's recently finished her PhD, Ruth Kirk, who finished her PhD with me a few years ago, uh, Bridie, who was an undergraduate student who did some of this research, Simon Crook, another uh, 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 PhD student, Stefania, who's an MRes student, and, and Julian Andrews, who's one of my colleagues here at UEA, a, a, a fellow professor here at UEA. So without much ado, let's let's uh, jump into the subject. Ooh. I'm having trouble now, wondering why my slides are not moving on. Let me uh, figure this out if I can. Ah, that's good. I don't need to press that. So here in this slide, I've just put up a, a, a very uh, cartoon-like image of Earth history from, from the formation of the Earth. Uh, just over four and a half billion years ago on the left hand side to the, the the present day on the right hand side and for a large part of that four and a half billion years in fact almost 4.2 billion years we believe that the 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 earth has had some form of oceanic hydrosphere there's evidence of the first oceans about 4.2 um, billion years ago uh, and just less than 4 billion years ago, we have the issue of sediments and with, with perhaps early isotopic evidence for life. So at the same time as the oceans developed on, on, on the Earth, it's almost um, certain that life started to develop as well, as well. And for that past 4.2 billion years, we don't really have a very good handle on what the oceanic conditions, principally oceanic temperature, was like. Uh, but it's critical that we do understand that if we're going to understand um, uh, uh, the evolution of life uh, and the evolution of the Earth's surface environment. Uh, and I've put on here uh, one, one or two uh, key events in here. And what I want to, to, to draw your attention to is this cell differentiation uh, next to the dinosaurs at the bottom. About 1.2 billion years ago, uh, there's evidence for the first cell differentiation and the, the formation of an epidermal layer uh, in this Bicelium brasieri. And that, uh, that fo those fossils, microfossils, are found in the Torridonian, uh, Torridonian sediments, about 1,200 million years old in the northwest of Scotland. On the left, I've shown a photograph of maybe some Torridonian stromatolites about 1200 million years old. And I'll show some data from those uh, 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 later on in the talk. And then we come on into the Phanerozoic where um, at the onset of the Cambrian and the explosion in hard shelled animals, particularly organisms uh, which secreted carbonate exoskeletons or carbonate shells, we have a, a much better control on the isotope composition of carbonates, particularly biogenic carbonates through the phenolizoic, but still not really good control on what that means in terms of temperature. So that kind of sets the background to, to what I want to talk about. And now I'm going to take a little detour into, into history here. This chap here is, is Harold Urey. Uh, Urey won the Nobel Prize for his work on the isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, particularly deuterium. Uh, he worked in the US nuclear program and he was a, a professor, a chemistry professor uh, uh, in Chicago. And in 1947, he gave a very, very important lecture, uh, the Liversidge Lecture, the Chemical Society of the Royal Institution in London. Uh, uh, sorry, in 1946, he gave the lecture, but the, the paper was actually published in 1947. And it was called the thermodynamic properties of isotopic substances. And in his paper, he's got this uh, rather very prescient um, uh, a statement. He says these calculations suggest investigations 
of particular interest to geology. A change from 0 degrees C to 25 degrees C should change the O18 content of carbonate by 1.004 relative to liquid water. Uh, Yuri had worked on the partitioning functions of isotopes in, in, in materials and determined that if you precipitate carbonate from water at different temperatures, then the 18 oxygen content of the carbonate should change by a small amount. And you can see that 1.004 is a very small amount uh, by just four parts per thousand over that 25 degree C range. In actual fact, it's slightly larger than that, but it's still very small. Now, at the time Yuri gave that lecture, it wasn't possible to measure the isotope composition of materials uh, to that degree of accuracy. Uh, uh, but coincidentally, in the same year, uh, sorry, let me, uh, before I say that, this is a principle of the, the isotope thermometer. It's basically, if we look at the top reaction, uh, where we exchange 18 oxygen in a water molecule with 16 oxygen in the, in the calcium carbonate molecule there, uh, that isotope exchange reaction is associated with a free energy change. Uh, here, it's a small free energy change. It's only about 70 joules per mole, such that the, the oxygen 18 preferentially resides in the carbonate lattice. And that, as you can see from that reaction, the equilibrium constant there is temperature dependent. Uh, and in delta notation, which is how we represent the isotopic composition of materials, uh, the fractionation factor is 1000 plus delta 18 over the carbonate divided by 1000 plus delta 18 over the water. But we can roughly say that this capital delta 18 over calcite water is simply the, the difference between the delta 18 over the, the carbonate minus the delta 18 over of the water. So at, at about 20 degrees C, carbonate is about 30 per mil enriched in 18 over compared with water. And that difference, 30 per mil, depends on temperature. It decreases as the temperature rises and it increases as the temperature decreases. But as I said, it wasn't possible to measure those very, very small differences. But coincidentally, in 1947, this, this um, uh, Alfred Neer at the University of Minnesota developed a mass spectrometer for isotope and gas analysis and published his paper in 1947 in the Review of Scientific Instruments. And this gave geochemists the right tool with which to measure to high precision the isotope composition of natural materials. And Neil went on to determine the isotope composition of many, many materials, both stable isotopes and radioisotopes, uh, including measuring the age of the Earth. And on the on the right in this slide is a picture of one of Near's sector mass spectrometers. He was the first to, to build a true sector mass spectrometer, which is essentially the same design of instruments that we use today, apart from the fact we have modern electronics, modern data acquisition systems, uh, uh, and modern vacuum systems. It is exactly the same physics. And within five years of Yuri's talk, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, in London and Nears' publication of a, a design for a mass spectrometer, uh, Yuri had got together a remarkable group in Chicago with various people such as Sam Epstein, Harmon Craig, and Bob Clayton, who are essentially the founding fathers of the whole subject of isotope geochemistry. Uh, Sam Epstein did a huge amount of work on a wide range of isotope systems to understand paleoclimates. Harmon Craig uh, was a polymath, but with great interest in the in the meteoric water cycle. Uh, and Bob Clayton was the first to discover mass independent fractionation in natural systems, which we'll return to at the end of the talk. So these are all key figures. And as I said, within five years of, of Yuri's talk in London, he had put together this group. And you can see here on this paper here, published in 1952, I believe, measurement of paleo temperatures and temperatures of the upper Cretaceous of England, Denmark, and the southeastern United States. 
by Yuri Lewinstam, Epstein and McKinney. And they had built a mass spectrometer at Chicago, similar to uh, Nier's design. And they'd taken, this is not a tree ring here on the left, it's a belemnite, a section through a belemnite. And they had sampled that belemnite at various places uh, from the outer edge through to its core. It looks like tree rings, they are actually growth layers. And determined the isotope composition and the temperature of the water in which the belemnite grew. So on the right, you can see in the lower plot, this is a rough temperature plot from the core out to the outer edge. And the temperature oscillates between about 15 degrees C and 20 degrees C, determining that this particular belemnite lived to be about four years old through mm. uh, several winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer seasons. So this was a remarkable achievement uh, in, in, in 1951, 1952. And subsequently, many, many thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, I think, Matthew, you'll know the, the number, it's probably 83,000, I think, in your paper, uh, uh, of isotope measurements have been made of both biogenic, marine biogenic, and marine inorganic carbonate going back through geologic time. So if we look at the upper plot here, this is a plot of the isotope composition of carbonates. Uh, these are biogenic carbonates uh, coded uh, uh, with regard to the type of species, whether they're brachiopods, bivalves, belemnites, etc., going back in time throughout the Phanerozoic, so we're going back 550 million years. On the right is the isotope composition of these carbonates, uh, and you can see that as we go back through time, there's a general tend for the carbonates to become more depleted in oxygen 18. So with modern values between zero and four, four per mil, depending on the temperature of the water that the organism lives in, as we go back in time, uh, to, towards the beginning of the Cambrian, the carbonates tend to have values of about minus 10 per mil. So there's a, a long-term secular drift in the isotope composition of carbonates. The inset graph at the bottom extends that record back to the earliest known carbonates, about 3.6 billion years. And you can see that that trend towards more depleted values continues. Now this chart has puzzled geochemists for uh, 50 or 60 years. And the question is, does it represent one, a temperature record? Two, does it represent changing ocean isotope composition? Three, does it represent diagenesis and metamorphism of the, the sediments in which these organisms, these fossils are found? Or does it represent some combination of two or all three of these processes? If it's a primary temperature record, then, and we assume that the ocean remains at zero per mil, by definition, the modern ocean is zero per mil, then it means that the early Cambrian ocean was as much as 60 degrees C, and the Precambrian into the Proterozoic and the Archean have temperatures of closer to 80 or 90 degrees C. These temperatures are difficult to, to reconcile with what we know, for example, uh, about the way biological enzymes operate. At these sorts of temperatures, the enzymes wouldn't be very reactive. Uh, and we know, for example, as well, that modern brachiopods tend to be cold water species. So it's hard to, to understand their evolution through very, very hot temperatures. Alternatively, rather than an isotope record or a temperature record, it could reflect a changing oxygen isotope composition. So perhaps the early ocean was depleted in oxygen 18, and these fossils are simply reflecting that depletion of the early ocean. If that were the case, then the early ocean would be largely temperate, like the modern day ocean. The third hypothesis of it being diagenesis and metamorphism reflects the fact that we know that if we take a marine sediment and it undergoes diagenesis, particularly with meteoric fresh waters, 
or it becomes metamorphosed and heated up, that tends to drive the isotope composition of carbonates towards more negative values. So we have three hypotheses here, uh, each of which is very, very difficult to resolve on the basis of the isotope measurements alone. And equally, it could be some combination of two or all three of these operating together. Now, Jan Weitzer, uh, a famous uh, uh, Canadian geochemist, argues that the isotope record is largely pristine. He bases that on, on uh, both textual and mineralogical evidence. On the left, this is a paper, one of Jan Weitzer's papers, he shows SEM uh, photographs of Silurian brachiopods. Uh, and you can see that the, the carbonate of the shell, the laminate in the shell, uh, is pristine with no evidence of, of recrystallization or, or, or neomorphism or anything like that. What you do see is in these little puncti, these little pores, some uh, later calcite grains, secondary calcite forming in the pores. So Weitzer argues, quite convincingly, I think, that these early fossils, these Silurian fossils, these, the, these um, uh, uh, early Phanerozoic fossils, uh, are pristine and represent the true isotopic composition of the shell material, uh, and it hasn't subsequently been modified by metamorphism. There's also a certain amount of mineralogic evidence uh, on the right is a simple phase diagram of aragonite and calcite. And we have many aragonitic fossils uh, that are still aragonite. They haven't transformed uh, to calcite, even though calcite is the stable mineralogic phase at Earth's surface conditions. So there's a certain amount of textural and mineralogic data that suggests that this isotope record here is pristine. And in actual fact, it's the changing ocean isotope composition that they're recording rather than change in temperatures. It's an important observation, and Weitzer has taken this observation uh, further uh, and suggests that the isotope record shows a decoupling of atmospheric CO2 and global climate during the Phanerozoic period. Uh, this paper was, was published in Nature in 2000 and became a very, very controversial paper for the obvious reason that Weitzer is strongly saying that CO2, which we know is a dominant greenhouse gas, and temperature of the Earth on geologic timescales is decoupled. And what Weitzer has done is he's taken that curve, the oxygen isotope record that I showed in the previous slide, I'm not sure I can go back to it. Yes, I can. And he's simply detrended the data. So he's removed that, that slope in the data. Uh, and what has resulted, as you remove the slope, you can see that there's a degree of structure in that data. And as you remove the slope, he's left the structure there. So he says that this structure represents the temperature of the Earth's surface, largely tropical oceans, uh, since most fossils are recovered from, from, from tropical low-latitude sediments, and shows that a climate has oscillated around a mean value between warm and cold periods. Now, on this plot, positive uh, detrended calcite delta 18O values record colder temperatures, and negative detrended calcite dating values are warmer temperatures. And these, this temperature oscillation is within quite narrow bounds, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 15 degrees C. Also, he's plotted on this data for glacial activity uh, in purple. And you can see that matches his isotope record and his Plotted on the right, the paleo latitude and indicated in grey on the graph, uh, the paleo latitude of ice rafted debris. So you can see that during the cold periods, ice rafted debris is found towards lower and lower latitudes. So he's got a degree of confirmation that the isotope record, uh, as he suggested, is 
principally one of changing ocean isotope composition superposed with an oscillating temperature record. Incidentally, this plot is very similar to recent temperature records proposed by Scottesian and, and, and various other authors. The various lines you can see on there are just uh, different smoothing algorithms he's used. So he's used different 3 million, 5 million, 10 million uh, uh, um, windows to, 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 to smooth the data. So the black line is far smoother than, for example, the pale blue line. Uh, and you can see on this right plot, he's got the mean tropical temperature from his data, it's actually, he's suggesting it's oscillating between minus four degrees compared to the modern tropics and say plus six degrees. So he's got this, this 10 degree to 15 degree temperature swing. And he argues that this is largely independent of CO2. The On the right plot, the purple spots are um, energy balance models for what the global temperature might be like for the various CO2 levels represented by the geocarb model on the left. And you can see that uh, the, the temperatures, for example, during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, or, or, or Jurassic and early Cretaceous, are quite cool, according to Weitzer, but we know that CO2 levels are quite high and therefore we would expect higher temperatures. So Weitzer uh, is arguing that, 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 that temperatures are decoupled. Now, one of the problems with using oxygen isotopes is that to be able to determine a temperature, we need to know the isotope composition of the host water and we need to know the isotope composition of, for example, the fossil or the inorganic carbonate. And in practice, we only ever know one of those. That's the, the fossil carbonate isotope composition. We don't know what the composition of the uh, contemporaneous ocean was at the time the fossil was, was a, a living organism. And so we make that assumption about the water isotope composition. Weitzer did. When he detrended, he made an assumption about the water isotope composition. Subsequently, over the past two decades, um, the new technique of clumped isotope geochemistry has been developed, which allows us the opportunity to measure the temperature at which a mineral forms without knowing the isotope composition of its host fluid or of the ocean in this case. This is clumped isotope geochemistry. And this chap here on the right, John Eiler at Caltech, was the first to um, develop this, this experimentally uh, uh, in the laboratory, these measurements. And clumped isotope geochemistry relies on the ordering of heavy isotopes in the carbonate anion. So here on the left, I've drawn three carbonate anions. It's a planar structure. At the top, the carbonate anion, which has its 12 carbon, the principal carbon isotope in the center, bonded to three 16 oxygens. In the middle on the left, we substitute the 12 carbon for a 13 carbon. And at the bottom on the left, we substitute an 18 oxygen for a 16 oxygen. And these are the principal isotopologues of the carbonate anion. On the right, I've plotted a carbonate anion, which has a 13 carbon at the center and an 18 oxygen. So this carbonate anion has two heavy isotopic um, isotopes within it. So it's a, it's a clumped isotopologue and it transpires that the the bond energy between or the bond strength between 13 and 18 oxygen is slightly stronger than that between 12 oxygen and 18, 12 carbon and 18 oxygen, or between 13 carbon and 16 oxygen. So there's a, a, a slight temperature dependence on the degree of ordering or the degree to which the carbon, heavy carbon and the heavy oxygen isotopes clump together. This is reflected in this reaction here. I've drawn it as a, as a sort of pictogram here of a, 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 a 12 carbon, 16 oxygen anion plus a 13 carbon, 18 oxygen clumped anion at the top. 
um, dissociating into a 13 carbon 16 oxygen anion and a 12 carbon 18 oxygen anion at the bottom. And we can work out the energy of those different isotopologues and it transpires that the energy of the, 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 the upper, uh, the 12 carbon 16 oxygen and, and, and the clumped um, isotopologue is less than that of those at the bottom. And that simply means that the 13 carbon and the 18 oxygen preferentially bond together. And if we can measure that degree of preference, we have a thermometer. And that thermometer doesn't involve water. And we can look at that here in this, 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 this chart here of all the isotopologues of, of CO2, 44, 45, 46, the principal ones, which contain uh, the 12 carbon, 16 oxygen, 13 carbon, 16 oxygen, and the 12 carbon, 18 oxygen isotopologues. If we look at the 47, that's the principal one we're interested in, 13 carbon, 18 oxygen, 16 oxygen, we can see on the right that it's there at 44, about 44.4 ppm. And we can represent that degree of clumping. Don't worry about the maths. Don't worry about the, just look at the bottom with this capital Delta 47. And what we're principally interested in is that first term on the right hand side of the, the equation. That's the 47 to 44 ratio of the sample that we measure divided by the 47 to 44 ratio that we would expect if all the isotopes were randomly distributed over all the lattice sites in the carbonate anion. And that gives us a degree of, a measure of the degree of clumping. The higher the value of delta 47, the more clumped or the more 13C, 18O bonds there are in the anion. And we measure that using conventional isotope ratio mass spectrometry. Uh, this is just a picture of our isotope ratio mass spectrometry in the lab. It's a home-built instrument, the Myra, and an old version of our prep line. And on the right, you can see that the we can measure all the principal isotopologues. We can see all the peaks, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, and 49. And enlarged at the bottom, we can see that the 48 and 49 are there as well, even though 48 is only there at 4 ppm and 49 is only there at 40 ppb. We can measure them. And this is a plot of a calibration. There's lots of lines on here, but I want you to focus just on the, um, the, the red line here. The red or the orange lines, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. They're both UEA calibrations, which plot the delta 47 value, remember this degree of clumping against 10 to the 6 over t squared. So at the left, this value of about 1.2 is 600 degrees C. And at the right, the value of about 13 is about 0 degrees C. So this scale, this horizontal scale, encompasses 600 degrees C. And the degree of precision we need to measure is illustrated on the right. At about 60 degrees C, we expect to see 44.42 ppm of the clumped species. And at about 0 degrees C, 44.432 ppm. So we have to measure to extraordinarily high precision. And it's a, it's a tribute to modern electronics and modern instrument design that we can do that nowadays. And, and, and have a temperature sensitivity at Earth's surface temperatures of about three to four degrees C. So with this new tool of clumped isotope geochemistry, uh, John Eiler's group, rather than saying CO2 and a temperature we decoupled, wrote a paper in Nature called Coupling of Surface Temperatures and Atmospheric CO con Concentrations During the Paleozoic Era. And they measured uh, some brachiopods from the Silurian um, and from the Carboniferous. And they got mean temperature anomalies that are represented by the diamonds in this plot here of plus seven degrees C for the Silurian and minus two degrees C for the Carboniferous. And the solid black line is that geocarb three CO2 model derived temperatures. 
And because they could measure the temperature independent of the water isotope composition, they could back out the water isotope composition. And you can see that reflected in the diamonds here, which shows that the isotope composition of the ocean at those times was between minus one and minus two per mil. The solid black line is Weitz's line that he's, um, he's used to detrend his data. So we have a, a, a difference in interpretation here, a difference in data. One group saying no CO2 does affect temperature and the ocean is near constant in isotope composition. These would be largely ice-free oceans, so they'd be slightly depleted compared to the modern day. And Weitz's group and and, Weitz, uh, and people who, who who support Weitz's contention uh, that the ocean in actual fact does change in composition and the clamped isotope data represented on the left are incorrect. I'm going to skip the next slide. Subsequent to that, in 2019, a very interesting study came out looking at iron oxides, marine iron oxides. Now, the importance about marine iron oxides is that they don't really fractionate. There's, there's a very, very weak temperature dependence of the oxygen isotope fractionation between the water and the precipitated oxide. So if we measure a variation in the isotope composition of the iron oxides, then that will reflect a variation in the isotope composition of the ocean rather than a variation in temperature. And these are the, these are the results from that study. And we can see that the iron oxides, as we go back in time from the present or, or from the Phanerozoic right through into, into the Proterozoic, the oxygen isotope composition of those iron oxides decreases. These two small plots in the middle are the, the superposition of that iron oxide data over the carbonate data at the bottom and some chert data at the top. And because the uh, the, the iron oxides don't really fractionate the isotopes or don't have, have a very weak temperature dependence, it's possible to work out the isotope composition of the precipitating fluid to the right. And you can see that it, indeed it decreases through geologic time. I'm going to skip these next slides because I'm running out of time. <laughs> and now I want to present some data uh, that, that we have uh, determined here at UEA. And I'm going to start in the Jurassic with Richmond Paxton's work on Jurassic septarian concretions. And do they, do they uh, record Earth's surface temperatures? These are concretions in mudstones, carbonate cemented mudstones that form very, very early in our, our, after, the, after the, the sediments have been deposited. So they're essentially uh, are recording the, the bottom temperature. There's a, and we're going to principally look at concretions from Staffin in Sky, but also some concretions from the Oxford clay near Peterborough. And there's a picture of a concretion on, on the, the upper right here, which shows the concretion body that's carbonate cemented. We call it concretion body calcite. These concretions then fracture and you get a, a fringing brown fibrous calcite fringe and then a white sparry calcite in the middle. I'll show some uh, pictures of these in the field. These are from Staffin. You can see these concretions, they're, they're very flattened. They lie within the sediment. And you can see that they're fractured uh, in this lower photograph here, and they're, they're quite buggy and, and porous. And in the in in the slice section, you can see the fractures in them with the brown cement and 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 the white cement. But what we are principally interested in is the is the the, the concretion body cement in in the grey body because that's the early cement prior to lithification and prior to fracturing. You can see that some of these fracture patterns can be quite extensive here um, in, in that one there. And what we have here is some isotope data from concretion body on the right and the brown fibrous calcite, which, which fringes these fractures and the yellow sparry calcite in the middle. Uh, if we look at the 18 oxygen carbon plot in the top left, I want you to focus on the the black circles and the black triangles, because those are the concretion body cements. 
and not the later cements because they represent a later diagenetic, the brown fringing and, and, and the yellow sporic calcite are later diagenetic cements. We've looked at the clumped isotopes on these and we've determined the temperature at which these form. And you can see that in the bottom right plot here, where if we look at the black circles and the black triangles, they're between about 10 degrees and about 16 degrees C. There's one, one anomalous plot at about 23 degrees C, but between about 10 and 16 degrees C. And because we know the oxygen isotope composition of the cement and its temperature, we can calculate the water isotope composition. And I've put that in this plot here on the lower left. Again, concentrate on the, the black circles and the triangles. And when we do that, we can... So this is a plot with temperature on the left, 18 oxygen composition of the calcite along the bottom, and it's contoured with respect to the isotope composition of the water in which, from which the, the calcite precipitated. And you can see that generally it's between minus one and minus two per mil contours on there. So we think this Jurassic seawater is between about minus one, minus two, possibly as low as minus three per mil. So the Jurassic seawater looks much like the modern ocean, maybe a little depleted in 18 oxygen, but we'd expect that because we don't have any polar ice caps at that time locking up isotopically very light water. All that isotopically light water is blended back into the ocean, so we'd expect the ocean to be a, a, a little depleted. You can see that I've enlarged that lower left plot here. So if we look at the the, the, the black circles and black triangles, we can see they're down in the lower right portion of that plot between minus one and minus three per mil water isotope composition and about minus one per mil carbonate isotope composition and temperatures of between 10 and about uh, 15, 16 degrees C. So that's the Jurassic. I'm now going to take you very, very quickly to the northwest of Scotland, to the Torridonian, uh, uh, and uh, particularly to Stir and Ennard Bay. Uh, it's reputed that the paleo environment at the time was a, a 1200 million year old lake in which there may have been some sort of stromatolite like body deposited. We published a paper on this in 2019, detecting ancient life, investigating the nature and origin of possible stromatolites and associated calcite from a one billion year old lake. So we're going up north of Ullapool to the, the, the very northwest of Scotland, to the west of um, the Moyne Trust looking at the Torridonian sediments, which directly overlie the, the, the Lewisian Precambrian Basin. And we can see what some of these sediments look like. Th these are the sediments that stir on the upper left. And here's a close-up of them, these sort of very laminar, what are reputed to be microbial carbonates. In thin section, you can see tufts and so on and so forth. And below, we can look at what are reputed to be stromatolites, Torridonian stromatolites, uh, at Ennard Bay in northwest Scotland, directly overlying the Lewisian basement. And I've tried to summarise all the data on this plot. It's, it's very, very complex. First of all, let's look at the left. What we can see are a series of photomicrographs of these supposed stromatolites. Uh, they're largely macritic in composition with dark, um, clay-rich, silt-rich layers between them. That you can see in the upper photomicrograph. The, there is a scale bar on there, but it's not very clear. That says 200 microns, that little uh, uh, scale bar at the top. But you can see patches within uh, uh, that upper slide um, uh, uh, photomicrograph, which show what look to be recrystallization on neomorphism and if we look down in at the bottom we can see one of these patches uh, in cross polar light where we can see uh, definitely uh, that some degree of recrystallization of these uh, this material has has occurred and if we look at the middle uh, uh, photomicrograph there's evidence of stylolite formation with these rather um, dentate uh, uh, dark layers uh, and 
precipitation calcite, uh, coarsely crystalline calcite, uh, uh, fairly adjacent to these. So we have directly photomicrograph evidence of alteration of these sediments, which makes them immediately difficult to interpret. In the plot B, I've plotted the 13C isotope composition against the 18O isotope composition. And we're looking at the red data here. Uh, here, not the green data, the red data. And they all plot with very depleted oxygen isotope values uh, uh, around minus 17 per mil and about between zero and minus four per mil carbon isotope composition. This is very, very depleted for carbonates. Typical modern marine carbonates are close to zero per mil, 18 oxygen. And if they undergo alteration or diagenesis, the isotope composition tends to follow that reverse J curve, typical of diagenesis. So it's been suggested that these carbonates represent very, very cold conditions. We know that meteoric waters, uh, cold meteoric waters in, in, in polar regions are very depleted except the paleo latitude when these formed was about 19 degrees north. So they're not um, a polar uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Now, I want you to look at plot D, because plot D records the clumped isotope temperature that we've determined from these uh, supposed stromatolites. And you can see that we've determined temperatures from about 28 degrees C right up to 160 degrees C. So these record a whole range of temperature. Certainly the upper temperatures cannot be representative of Earth's surface conditions. And what we think is happening is that what we're recording here is a diagenetic signal. We know from the photomicrographs these uh, samples are undergoing a degree of dissolution and reprecipitation uh, at higher temperatures. But at the lower end, it may be just that we are sampling the true temperature, that we are sampling an unaltered patch of these stromatolites, and we're getting temperatures close to true conditions. Now, the plot is complicated because what I put on here are two sets of contours. The gray set represent the isotope composition that the carbonates are of the fluid that the carbonates are in equilibrium with. And they're in equilibrium with fluids of typical composition at the lower temperature end between minus 12 and minus 18 per mil. These are very depleted fluid isotope compositions. And it's possible if one develops a very simple Rayleigh distillation model for meteoric water, and we did that in the plot on the left. The black line shows our Rayleigh distillation model. It's simply based on uh, the latent heat of evaporation of water and the clausius clapeyron equation for the, the, the liquid vapor phase boundary, plotted against modern meteoric water data. And you can see that the Rayleigh model fits. If we apply that Rayleigh model to uh, this early Torridonian, we can see in red and blue the likely composition of the ocean that will be required to precipitate carbonates of this composition. And it's between minus 12 and minus 16 per mil, probably minus 8 to minus 16 per mil. The, the blue and the red represent different temperatures of evaporation from the global ocean. So I'm going to have to move on fast because that time's gone very quickly. If we superpose our Jurassic values on the Weitzer curve, so we have the in blue at 1,200 million years old, we have uh, about minus 8 to minus 16 per mil ocean isotope composition and minus 1 to minus 4 for the Jurassic. We can see that, that our clumped isotope data and interpretation tends to suggest that the ocean is changing isotope composition rather than that the, the early ocean was very, very warm. Now, I just want to say very, very quickly, skim over these slides because I can't say too much about the, the oxygen 17 thermometer. But to say that we have two systems here when we're working with clumped isotopes and bulk isotopes. One is heterogeneous equilibrium. That's equilibrium between a fluid and the carbonate represented at the top. 
And we have homogeneous equilibrium that's equilibrium within the carbonate lattice, which just measures the ordering of the, the heavy isotopes. And we can reset, or these systems can behave independently. We could, for example, have solid state resetting during metamorphism of the clumped isotopes. But if it's in a fluid free environment, we don't change the heterogeneous equilibrium. And one way of looking at this is to start to use 17 oxygen, which is a, a, a third stable isotope of, 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 of oxygen. And on the on the, the, the graph on the right, there's a potential uh, uh, delta 17O, delta 18O geothermometer. Where if we can measure this delta 17O on the left, and that's a departure from what's known as mass uh, dependent fractionation, we can have a temperature profile on the right. And the important thing about that is that for a system to be in true equilibrium, it can only occupy one point in temperature 18 oxygen delta 17 oxygen space. And if our system that we measure departs from this, then we can say something about the processes. So I've just quickly uh, illustrate that here in these, these, these red circles here. If we have solid state resetting, we'd expect our samples to move in that trend in temperature delta 18 O space upwards, vertically upwards in that graph on the right. And in delta 17 O temperature space to move to the left if we have solid state resetting. If we have uh, hydro uh, or meteoric water resetting, we'd expect it to move to the right here. So we can sit, so we can now separate out different processes if we include 17 oxygen. Uh, and, and you can see it down here on the right there. So by including 17 oxygen, we will be able to um, say something more definite about the processes and try and understand the isotope, isotope equilibrium in these systems much, much better. Here's a sketch of the, uh, of the system we're building at UEA to do it. It consists of our mass spectrometer photographed in the bottom here, being interfaced to our, our infrared 17 oxygen spectrophotometer here on the left. And we're interfacing it with a, 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 an electrostatic analyzer which allows us to make high mass resolution isotope ratio measurements and eliminate any effects due to contaminants and so on and so forth. But this is an ongoing project, parts of it under, under construction at the moment. Uh, so it's going to take two or three years before we can realize this, I suspect, altogether. But once we have, we'll be able to define completely the isotopic state of a, of a carbonate mineral whether it be biogenic or inorganic. And that will allow us to say something much, much more definite about the initial temperatures and subsequent processes that may lead to modification of the isotope record. So I'm gonna conclude there and say that clumped isotopes has the potential to offer new insights into debate about Earth's surface temperatures and the isotope composition of the ocean through geologic time. And new developments in oxygen triple isotope or 17 oxygen chemistry will definitely contribute further to the debate. I didn't show any data from the Triassic because I didn't have time, but data from the Triassic and Jurassic are consistent with an ice-free global ocean of circa minus one to minus two per mil, which is consistent with extant data. But evidence from the Mesoproterozoic, the Torridonian, strongly support an isotopically depleted ocean by more than 12 per mil, and therefore, temperate conditions during the early or during the, the Mesoproterozoic and possibly temperate, temperate conditions going back quite a long time in Earth history. Okay, I'm sorry I had to rush through that so fast.